<laughs> morning again. <laughs> Third time's always a charm. Well, wishing you a very happy Hanukkah. And uh, as I said before, some of you may be wondering why during this Christmas season I am wishing you a happy Hanukkah. And the reason is that right now, millions of Jews throughout the world are celebrating this season. So uh, we thank God for them. And just, I, just recently I came across some photos, one of IDF soldiers huddled around in the midst of this war, singing songs of Hanukkah. Um, and it's just absolutely, totally amazing to me what's going on in the nation of Israel. And as you know, Jesus was Jewish. I know that uh, he, many may think that he celebrated Christmas. Well, he did not, obviously. Jesus was Jewish, and he celebrated the Jewish feasts. He uh, loved to celebrate. And let me tell you something. There is a mystery, actually, that is connected with Christmas. December 25th is a day that we normally spend and you know take that day to observe the birth of Christ. But this morning, I'm going to show you a mystery that it's connected to Hanukkah that's going to blow your mind. Um, that Christmas is actually Jewish, if you will. But um, Jesus, as I said, was Jewish, and Jesus loved to celebrate the Jewish feasts. There were seven feasts in Israel. Jewish was at the temple. He was in Jerusalem, always celebrating the Jewish feast. He loved to party, I guess you'd say. Uh, but he loved to get together with the, the, the his fellow uh, Israelites and they would get together and celebrate Passover and Pesach as some know it and Feast of Tabernacles and all these other feasts but one of the feasts that Jesus loved to celebrate as well was Hanukkah and amazingly we find the story of Hanukkah not in the Old Testament where we think it started but no it's actually found one time in the Gospel of John chapter 10 verses 22 through 30 I'm going to read uh, that scripture right to you right now and uh, I want you to understand that Jesus was celebrating and was in Jerusalem. And I'll read it from John chapter 10, verse 22 and 30 to 30. At that time, the Feast of Dedication, which is another name for the Feast of Hanukkah, or the celebration of illumination of lights, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews, this is the religious leaders, then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, if you are the Christ, tell us openly. In other words, if you're this Messiah, then be public about it. Now, there's sometimes when people ask you questions, they do so with sincerity. You know, uh, Mary she was a virgin. She couldn't understand how she was going to conceive uh, a child. And Gabriel said, no, you're going to conceive. And she said, how is this going to be since I'm a virgin? That was a legitimate question. Well, the angel Gabriel also went to two other people who were elderly and told them the same thing, that they were going to bear a child that was going to be John the Baptist. They were elderly and Zechariah then asked the question, well, how is this going to be? Well, that was a question um, that was really insincere because we find out in Luke chapter 1, it really didn't do with the fact of how you're going to do this, but it was unbelief. So sometimes people are sincere in their questions and wanting to know, and that's what God always looks for, a sincere heart. You know, when we have questions, there's nothing wrong with questions and asking questions. But these folks right here, the religious leaders, uh, they were a little tricky. Many times when you go into the scriptures, into the gospels, and you read the account of what was going on, and when they asked questions, it was always to lure Jesus, to test Jesus, to kind of try to trap him. And I believe this is one of those situations, and we're going to understand why later on. If you are the Christ, why do you keep us in suspense? Tell us openly. Jesus answered them, verse 25, John chapter 10. I told you, <laughs> I told you already, and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. I told you, my words are already out there, and the works that I do also are a witness to me. And then he goes on to say this, My sheep hear or listen to my voice, 
and I know them, and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life, and they will never perish, ever. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So why is it that these religious leaders come to Jesus and really are surrounding him? That's the language. They surround him almost in a violent sense. They're, they're coming around him as he's walking through the portico of Solomon's you know, uh, temple. And, and they ask him, listen, you tell us right now, are you the one? Are, are you the one that we should be looking for? Are you the one that should be, you know, uh, the next Messiah? Why are they asking it? And why are they asking it at this particular time during Hanukkah? Why are they? Why are they pressing Jesus? Jesus has been with them for years. Why is it on this day that they're pressing Jesus? Well, I think to understand that we need to go back into history a little bit, understand what Hanukkah uh, is all about, when it started, who were involved in it. And I think that'll bring some light, some illumination, if you will, with regards to why the Jewish leaders are asking Jesus this question now during the Hanukkah season. It was probably 200 years prior to Christ that Hanukkah began. It was in a season that uh, we refer to theologically as the 400 silent year years. They were dark years. Um, it was the last book of the Bible had been written, Malachi, and now uh, this was 200 years in, and there is no spoken prophet, no word from God. The people of Israel are kind of like in the dark, if you will. Um, and then something started to happen in the nations. Uh, there's a king that started to rise. His name was Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He was a Syrian king who ruled over the Greek, over Greek uh, areas, over the Greece. And so he started to come into various areas. Epiphanies literally means um, God manifest. This is how, how prideful uh, Antiochus thought he was. He considered himself the manifestation of God on the earth. You know, he thought he was God's gift to the world. And he began to conquer different lands. He would go into the Alps, and then he went from the Alps into different parts uh, of... Um, of the nations, uh, North Africa, then he went into Europe, and then from Europe he went into the Middle East, and then ultimately conquered and took uh, dominating power over Israel. And one of the things that he was famous for doing, because he was so embedded within this Greek culture, now you think about this, this is a Syrian king, but he had given himself over completely to the Greek gods, the Greek goddesses, to the Greek culture, you know, wearing togas, you know, the whole Caligula, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, orgies and all. He embraced that lifestyle. He became their king in Greece, and now he's going out conquering lands. And every time he would conquer a nation, what he would do is he would bring basically like these chariots filled with gods, all the gods of uh, Greece, the gods and the goddesses of Greeks, and he'd have his soldiers go into this uh, territory that they just conquered. And the soldiers would go into the places of worship, whether it was Jewish worship or, you know, whatever worship they had. They would go into those places, into those temples, and they would erect these Greek gods. Zeus would be there, Apollo, and all these other kind of gods would be there. And they would command the people in that nation to bow down. They said, listen, we have conquered your land Greece is now ruling, Epiphanes wants you, Antiochus wants you to bow down and worship this. And many believe also that Antiochus also had a statue of himself. So people had to bow down because he claimed that he was God manifest on the earth. And many peoples and cultures did that very thing. They bowed down. If they didn't do it, the soldiers would immediately kill those people. So you could see why people would succumb to this. And territory after territory, nation after nation, they would bring in these chariots filled with these Greek gods and do this repeatedly, do it over and over again. Well, the same occurred in Israel. They went into one town and they would find an Italian, uh, Italian, a Jewish village. <laughs> and they would bring in these Greek gods. They would go into a temple. They would set up these Greek gods. And when the Jewish people came in, 
they would command, bow down to these things. And many of the Jewish people reluctantly, they bowed down because they didn't want to get killed because they saw what happened to other nations. Well, this went on from one town to another town to another. And they came to this one town where there was an old retired Jewish priest. His name was Matthias. And the soldiers came in with their little caravan of gods, set up shop, you know, a little god kit, if you will, did the same thing, had the people come, and they said the same thing, you bow down to these things. Matthias, this older Jewish priest, got up, looked at the people, the Jewish people, and says, you do not do this. This is not what God wants. This is a disobedience to the commandments of God. You shall not bow down to any idols. You shall not worship them. We have the one true God, and him alone shall we worship. One person tried to bow down, and Matthias actually slew him right there on the spot. The people joined forces with Matthias, and they actually jumped on those Greek soldiers, overtook them, and decided, we're going to go back, and we're going to recapture the land, recapture Israel. And so they did that, and they are called the Maccabees. Uh, Matthias had five sons. One of the sons that was most you know, infamous for all of this was Huda Maccabee. And Maccabee in Hebrew literally means hammer. This is the violence to which they took back their nation. It seemed like they were hammering through. Every time they would go to another uh, part of Israel, they would hammer their way through and they would win that territory and go one after another until they captured all of Israel. And um, that was an amazing miracle in itself because they were up against, I think it was 47,000 Greek soldiers. And here it was just a small band of Hebrew, Jewish farmers, really, and prophets and priests who were fighting against these uh, individuals. So that was a miracle in itself. Against all odds, God really gave them victory. But they won every part of the land. This took three, uh, probably three years, three and a half years. Many believe three and a half years. And I want you to remember that three and a half years that it took to conquer the land. And what happened was when they got to Jerusalem, they entered into the holy temple. And when they did, they saw something that was absolutely, utterly astonishing. They walked into the temple, and before their eyes, there was the statue of whether it was Antiochus Epiphanes or Zeus, but many believe it was Antiochus Epiphanes, a statue of Antiochus Epiphanes within the Holy of Holies. And on the altar, there was a pig slain, something absolutely unkosher, something that God forbade. You were only to bring the blood of an innocent lamb and sacrifice that on the mercy seat. And here on the altar, there was a pig slain. And if that were not enough, Antiochus then took the blood when he was there and had the blood poured out on the Torah scrolls. Think about that. It's like taking blood and, and pouring it on the Bible. Imagine something like that happened. Imagine someone coming into your church, our church, setting up, you know, a statue of himself and then commanding individuals to bow down to it. Well, this was the thing that Daniel had prophesied was going to happen, and he called the abomination of desolation. Jesus will later refer back to this and say, listen, there is going to be a type of Antiochus Epiphany that is going to arise in the future. That is going to be the Antichrist. And I, you have it historically. And it's amazing that the whole story of Antichrist is really tied into the story of Hanukkah. I, I couldn't believe that when I found that out. I thought it was just absolutely amazing that there's a prophetic significance there as well. But this is what was happening. And this is what happened in that day during the Maccabees. That Antiochus Epiphanes had set up an altar of himself. I'm sorry, a statue of himself within the holy temple had a pig slain on it, poured out the blood even upon the Torah scrolls. So, as you can imagine, the Jews were heartbroken. They rent their clothes. They began to you know, repent. They began to cry out to the Lord for mercy. And uh, God, in His grace, understood and heard and delivered these people. But they came in and they began to uh, take the stones out of the altar from the, the temple. They began to clean the inside, there was a renewal that was going on, a cleansing that was going on within the temple itself. 
they removed those stones of the altar, they brought in new stones, they erected a new altar, and there was a new dedication. That is why it's called the Feast of Dedication. They rededicated the temple back unto God. So that is the story of Hanukkah. But there is also within Hanukkah something very interesting. The day that they did the cleansing and the day that they uh, started to celebrate Hanukkah was, listen to this, this is written in 1 Maccabees, you can read it for yourself, it's an apocryphal book, but it's historical. It says that Hanukkah was instituted, quote, on the 25th day of the ninth month, which is the month of Chislev, or Chislev, the 25th day of the month of Chislev. You know what the month of Kislev is in Hebrew, translating it into English? December. December 25th was the day that Hanukkah was initiated. And you say, oh, that's the day we celebrate Christmas. Exactly. So let me just tell you something. Christmas is Jewish, whether you understand it or not. And its roots go back into Hanukkah. On the 25th day of December is the day that they began to celebrate Hanukkah 200 years before Christ. And Jesus, we find, comes uh, into the temple courts in that season of Hanukkah. He's celebrating Hanukkah. But there's something else that really happened, uh, that was amazing, that really happened as well during this time. After they rededicated the temple, there is a menorah, and I have a small one here. Uh, but a menorah lamp that was in the temple that had to be burning 24-7. It couldn't stop burning. That was the Levitical law that God said, you have to keep the light burning 24-7. The light cannot go out. It cannot be distinguished, extinguished. What happened was that uh, the light had been out, obviously, because of what Antiochus Epiphanes had done. They, they smothered the light. They didn't want any light in there at all. And when the Jewish priest came in there, they realized they only had enough oil to burn for one day. Now, it takes them eight days to make the oil. They have to go into the olive groves. They have to take the olives. They have to crush them a certain way, purify them, filter them, do it again and again until they have a specific oil that they can put with them in the menorah. They only had one day's oil. And so by faith, they put the wick in the menorah. They lit the oil uh, they lit the, you know, the candle, the wick rather, and they burned and they figured we've got eight days uh, to make this new oil and it's, the light is sure to go out. So we have to hurry up and do this. Well, to their utter amazement, they came back on the second day and they found that the menorah light was still shining. On the third day, they came back and the menorah light was still shining off of that one little flask of oil. They came back the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and the eighth day. By the eighth day, they had a new cruise of oil that they could pour in, but the light was still shining. That is the miracle of Hanukkah as well. Not only the preservation of God's people when they were, Antiochus was trying to annihilate them, that God preserved them. God brought about the miracle uh, that was in the oil as well to preserve. And that's, that's why they celebrate, Jews today continue to celebrate Hanukkah for eight days. It's amazing, isn't it? So this is the background which we come to. When we read in John chapter 10, at that time, the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, only time mentioned in Scripture, took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus, Jesus, who is the light of the world, John chapter 8, verse 12, was walking in the temple portico of Solomon. And it was at this time that the Jews gathered around him, and they were saying to them, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. There were two schools of thought regarding the Messiah. One school of thought that the religious leaders had was that the Messiah was going to be a political and military leader, like Judah Maccabee. Um, the other school of thought understood that the Messiah was going to be one who is going to redeem Israel from their sins. There was a spiritual aspect to it. So one school of thought said, we're waiting for Messiah that is going to be a political leader. He's going to take over the world. He's going to usher in peace. Uh, he's going to be a military giant like Judah Maccabee. And then there's the other school of thought that understood, no, it's not going to be a military leader, at least not now. What we're waiting for is the redemption of Israel 
freedom from our sins, freedom from the snares of the enemy and the powers of darkness. Um, yeah, the, other, the one school of thought wanted to be freed from Roman oppression. The other school of thought said, no, we want to be freed from spiritual oppression of the enemy. Those who sat in darkness, it says in Isaiah, saw a great light. And that's what many wanted to see. They were waiting for a great light because they were sitting in darkness. My theory is that those who asked this question to Jesus were those on the side of the camp that were waiting for Judah Maccabee, waiting for a hero to arise that would free them from Roman oppression. And Jesus is telling them plainly, listen, you're coming to me and you're asking me to show proof of myself, to give evidence, to tell you verbally who I am. And you know what? I've already told you that, but you do not believe. You see, Jesus had told them over and over and over again, I am the one who came from heaven. John chapter 3 verse 13. These Jewish leaders heard that. He said, whoever believes in me has eternal life. John chapter 3 verses 5, uh, 13, uh, 3 verse 15. He told them, I am the unique son of God. I, I will judge all humanity. He said that you should honor me just as you honor the Father. Uh, the Hebrew scriptures, he said, testify of me. Uh, I have perfectly revealed the Father to you. I always do those things that are pleasing unto the Father. I haven't sinned. I don't sin. I'm blameless. You know, I am uniquely sent from God. And then here's the clincher, John chapter 8, verse 58. He said this already. Before Abraham was, I am. The Jews already heard that, right? Um, he was the son prophesied by Daniel. He was the one who would raise himself. And not only all this stuff, he's the light of the world and the bright and shining star, the door, the good shepherd, and so on. You want me to tell you who I am? And you've heard it over and over and over again. And not only have you heard it, but you've seen my works. You know, John the Baptist had a moment, an eclipse of faith in his life. He was in prison, and he sent messengers to Jesus. Now listen to this. This is John the Baptist, the greatest prophet who ever lived, according to Jesus. And this prophet had an eclipse of faith while he's in prison, while he's going through some difficult times. He sends messengers to Jesus, and he says, Are you the one, or should we look for another? Are you the one, or should we look for another? Do you see the doubt that's happening in John's heart? Now that he's in prison, now that he's surrounded by darkness, he's wondering, wait a minute, am I following the right guy? And so he sends messengers to Jesus. And it's okay to doubt, friend. Uh, but he sent messengers to Jesus. And they asked that question. John wants to know, are you the one or should we look to it for another? And while they were watching Jesus. Jesus was performing signs and wonders and miracles, heal, healing the lame, the sick, raising dead, preaching the gospel. And Jesus turns around to them and says, listen, you go back to John and you tell John, here are the credentials of the Messiah. I'm raising the dead. I'm healing the sick, the lame walk, the deaf can hear. The gospel is being preached unto the poor. They take that message back to John and you never hear a peep from John again. Why? Because he knew very well that the credentials for the Messiah were right there in the Tanakh in the Old Testament, that part of it was going to be the miraculous, that no one would be able to do this stuff. These priests that are asking Jesus, tell us plainly who you are. Such fabrication, such liars. Tell us who you are. They're looking for that political Messiah, and Jesus will not give in to their request. They want Jesus to succumb. They want basically Jesus to say, listen, I know what you guys want. I know that during this season, Judah Maccabee rose up, the hammer rose up, they defeated the Grecian armies and the peoples, and you want me to do that against Rome. I'm not here right now to do that. One day I'm going to come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and I am going to dominate the earth, yes. But right now I've come to seek and to save those who are lost, amen? Those Jewish people couldn't get it into their heads, those religious leaders, they were so stuck on seeing Jesus a certain way that they wouldn't have an open heart or an open mind. You know, Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, is also called the Feast of Lights or Illumination. The late Dr. Alfred Edersheim said that there was an extra illumination of the temple during the celebration of Hanukkah in Christ's time in that area that he was at. 
I want you to get a picture of that. Jesus is walking into the temple grounds. And a few months earlier, they had this, you know, celebration of illumination that was going on. And there were lights everywhere. And still, two months later, there's lights all over the place during the season of illumination. And the lights are all over the place. And Jesus, the light of the world, is walking, is walking in the midst of all of this light. And he is surrounded by Jewish people, religious people. And let me tell you something, friends. They ask him the question, who are you? That, that, that blows my mind away. Jesus, the light of the world, amidst all of this light, right there in the temple precincts, God manifest in the flesh, right there before them. And yet they're blind. They're still in darkness. That so just troubles me, friend, because there are so many people that are out there, so many individuals who claim to be Christians, who are saying, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And yet when the truth, the evidence is presented to them, they still want to have it their way. They want to conceive a Jesus of their own image and of their own liking. They want to make a Jesus who they can, you know, pros you know fall down and worship. They don't want to read about the Jesus of the scriptures. They, they want to read uh, and understand or have a, uh, an idea of a Jesus that they feel, uh, you know, is what they want to be. Oh, that, that's just not right. I can't get out of my mind that these Jewish religious leaders who had the scriptures, who were reading over the scriptures, were looking at Jesus, the manifestation, the word who has become flesh right before them. Shocking. This light, illumination all the way around, and yet they are blind. Why? You do not believe, Jesus said. Oh, unbelief. What unbelief will do. How it will keep individuals within darkness. What a shame. What a shame indeed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the Apostle Paul wrote this, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this world has blinded the eyes and the minds of unbelievers, those who will not believe. Oh, Pray if you have an unbelieving heart to say, Lord, please forgive me for my unbelief. Change my heart, Lord. Amen. This, this is what happens with people who do not believe. They, they fall into this. They succumb to this. And the light of the gospel is hid from them. How awful that is going to be on the day of judgment when people stand before Christ and their eyes are revealed and open and they cannot uh, withhold the light anymore. They have to stand before him. But thank God there is, for those who do believe, believe illumination. I want to read John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus says, My sheep, listen, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Oh, isn't that glorious? You see, those who do believe are illuminated. And one of the illuminations we have is that we are God's sheep. Amen? We are the sheep of his pasture. He calls his own sheep by name, the good shepherd. He leaves the 99 sheep and he goes and runs after that one little sheep who wants to see, who believes. And he waits until he finds that little sheep. Uh, he is the one who gathers the lambs, the little sheep in his arms, and carries them uh, close to his heart. The good shepherd is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. And let me tell you something, there's some qualifiers for those who are true sheep of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, my sheep, listen to that, my sheep, that's a relationship. You're part of Jesus' uh, flock, amen. My sheep, they hear my voice. They listen. It's the same thing as Shema Israel, hero Israel. Listening is not only listening, but having an ear with the heart that wants to do. You follow me? Let me repeat that again. It's having an ear with a heart that wants to do. Okay? That's the whole point of hearing. It's not just about listening. The Apostle James warns us, don't be listeners or hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word, lest you deceive yourself. James chapter 1, verse 22. You get it? There's a lot of people who love to come to church, who love to hear the word of God, but you know what? It's very difficult. 
and to have those same people do the Word of God. Mm. There's the story. It's not only about listening, but doing. And what does James says? Don't be a listener only, but a doer. Why? Lest you deceive yourselves. You see, we are living in a world of deception. We are living in, a, in the world where the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. And let me tell you something. The devil, when he came down, first came down to Adam and Eve. They were perfect. And what did he do? He twisted the word of God and they were deceived. Let me tell you, there are a lot of false prophets out there. Jesus says, do not be deceived. He was talking to his children. The Apostle James, do not be deceived. Peter, do not be deceived. Over and over, the Gospels, the, the, gospel, the Apostles are telling us not to be deceived. So many Christians think, well, I'm born again, I'm spirit-filled. You know, I, I get into the Bible every once in a while. I read the Word of God. But let me tell you something. How are you going to know the voice of the devil and the voice of Jesus? How are you going to know the, the voice of deception and the voice of Jesus? You have to get into this book, friend. You have to get into the gospel. You have to know the word of Jesus so that when a lie comes, you are quick to, to say, no, that is not the mouth. That is not from the mouth of Jesus. That's how you hear. My sheep listen. They hear my voice. Don't look for some audible voice outside. Look for the word of God. Read the word of God and you will be able to discern between the spirit of error and the spirit of what is right. Can I get a witness on that? Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Wow. Illumination. Jesus is giving illumination on the day of Hanukkah saying, listen, you're not part of my sheep, you Pharisees and you Sadducees, because you will not believe me. But my sheep, no, they've been illuminated. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. They're my sheep. They hear my voice. They listen to me when I speak the word of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And they follow me. Illumination number one. You are his sheep. Illumination number two. We have eternal salvation. Amen. Verse 28a of John chapter 10. I, Jesus, I am the Savior. I am not only the the shepherd, but I am their savior. I give eternal life to them. Wow. Eternal. Who's offered you eternal life recently? Has anybody? Has anybody come off the street and say, listen, I want to give you something. I want to give you a gift. And that gift is not only life, right? Doctors are blessed to be able to give us life so many times, but no doctor, no physician is able to give us eternal life. Only the great physician is able to give us eternal life. Amen. This is eternal life in glory with him in heaven. Hallelujah to the, pray, uh, to the Lamb of God. I give unto them eternal life, and they're going to spend eternity with me in glory, in paradise. Eye has not seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the imagination of the heart of man. What God has pl uh, planned and done for those he, who love him, waiting for us in heaven. Amen? Glory to God. I give unto them eternal life. And they will never perish ever. Think about that. This is eternal uh, salvation. They will never perish. The, there's an emphatic, what they call double negative in the Greek here. No, not ever. They will not perish. They will not uh, come to a miserable end. They will never die uh, by destruction. They will never be destroyed. They will never be cut off. Uh, God says in his word, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Hallelujah. There's five negatives in that. Literally, I will never, ever, ever leave you. I will never, ever forsake you. I am with you always, even unto the end of the ages. Jesus is going to hold on to us. Amen. We have security in this salvation. He is the Savior, and we have security in God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Illumination one, number one, we're his sheep. Illumination number two, we have eternal salvation and security. Illumination number three, verse 28b, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. No one's going to be able to snatch us out. No devil, no demon, nothing is going to be able to snatch us from the hand of God. Do you see the security that you have in Christ? Illumination. Jesus is giving illumination on the day of Hanukkah. 
right there in John chapter 10. Illumination, if you believe, you're my sheep. Illumination, number one, I'm going to save you, eternal life. Illumination, number three, nothing's going to des destroy you. You have eternal security on top of that. Illumination after illumination after illumination. We have become the illuminated ones by the illuminator, by the power of the Holy Ghost, that menorah lamp that is dwelling inside of our hearts by faith. Amen. When the Holy Spirit came to dwell inside of us, the light of God's glory came down God came to dwell inside of us. The Bible says that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. Amen? Woo. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling Pentecostal this morning. The Apostle Paul said, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor any other thing in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody say illumination. Illumination. This is the feast, the celebration of illumination. Jesus is giving us illumination right here. Amen. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 that your life and my life is hid together with Christ whose life is in God. Now, I, I just want to share something with you briefly. I got some Tupperware. Uh, and I'm just going to point out something about that scripture. Colossians chapter 3. Let's make believe this is you, right? The Bible says, your life is hid together in Christ. All right, so there you go. You're going right there in Christ. That's you, and you're going inside of Christ. But Christ's life is hid within God. Here we go. So now we're going to seal that up, because the Bible says you are sealed with the Holy Spirit promise as well. So there you go. So your life is hid in Christ, and Christ is hid in God. All right, so let me ask you something. When the devil wants to try to get to you, who does he have to go through? <laughs> you see, he can't get to you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God, because you're safe within the hands of Jesus Christ, and his hand is within the Father's hand. You get it? There's double, triple security right here. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of, of, of promise. Amen. There's nothing that's going to get into you, friend. Nothing that's going to be able to penetrate you. Amen. You're safe and secure in Christ, in Christ Jesus. That's why it's so important to have that. I don't know about you, but that's some good news for the Christmas blues. Uh, if you know somebody who's got some Christmas blues, let me tell you something. Ask them to come and watch this. If they don't know Jesus Christ, then do yourself a favor. Invite that person. Say, listen, give them some illumination. I think this is the, the season that you want to share illumination with others as well. Amen? You want to be able to light the candle and say, listen, I want you to have the light of the Lord in your life, and I want you to enjoy the light of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I want you to understand that Jesus wants to come in. He wants to take that darkness out of you. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, Ye, you and I, were once darkness, but now are we light in the Lord. Therefore, walk, conduct your lives as children of light. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are to be light walkers. Just as Jesus walked and he is the light, we are to walk in the light as he is the light. And we have fellowship with one another, the Bible says. But you've got to let your light shine this season. This is a season of illumination. Jesus was there in the temple precincts on Hanukkah. And thank God he was there to share the light, to celebrate the light, to show the light to others. And even those in darkness, that's the frightening thing. When they were given the light did not yield to the light, but rather wanted to snuff it out, put it away, wanted to walk away from the light and continue to walk in darkness. Isaiah said, oh, those that were in darkness saw a great light. Oh, and thank God the light was shown upon them. They embraced the light. Have you embraced the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you living in unbelief? Let me tell you something. As soon as you cross that line from unbelief to belief in Christ Jesus, illumination, the lights will go on and you will see things in a whole new perspective and a whole new light because his light is dwelling within you. In his light, 
we see light. Even if it's dark out, let me tell you some: the light of the gospel, the word of God, is a light unto us, amen, unto our paths. And, and you have to get into this light, into the word of God, to hear his voice and to be able to follow through. Father, thank you so much for your ch children of light. Lord God, thank you for this Hanukkah season. Father, we pray that the light of your gospel may go forth and shine, Lord God, on our relatives and friends, neighbors who are in darkness. Father, help us to be vessels of light. We pray, Father, that you would allow us to be filled with your Holy Spirit, that the candle not burn out, Lord God, that the oil be replenished every single day. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your fire. Fill us with your light so that when others see us, they may see the light of the gospel inside of us. And Lord God, that we would have the opportunity, open up doors, we pray, so that people may hear the good news. And Lord, we pray, let them be receptive and open to your voice, we pray, as we speak. Oh, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his light to shine upon you and his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance on you, and the Lord grant you shalom, peace peace and healing in Jesus' holy name. We love you, friends. God bless you. Happy Hanukkah. Keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen. Love you. God bless you.